Well, good morning, church. We still doing okay? All right. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth and Leanna and Lindsay just for, for slaying for Jesus. Is that a thing? I don't know. You know, it was really good. All right. Hey, um, we're in John chapter four. What we're doing is we're walking through the gospel of John, the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're just going to spend, we're spending 37 weeks in this. And this is week eight of 37. And so you've missed any of the weeks. No worries. They're all online. Uh, you can walk through it. And actually this week kind of piggybacks off of last week because it's the same story. And so uh, if you weren't here last week and you missed it, you can go back and, and get it. We're not going to leave you behind or anything like that, but it's just a continuation of the woman as well. And so we're going to be in John chapter four. If you're here today and you do not have a Bible, no worries. Just go out those doors, turn left, go to the welcome desk. We have a whole bunch. We just had to order more because we've been giving away all the time. And so we would love to give you a Bible as our gift from us to you. We just want you to have that. Now, over the years, I guess, especially growing up. When I was young, I had all kinds of different things that I wanted to be. Did any of y'all like have dreams or something that you thought you wanted to be and then you didn't become that? You know, just like, you know, you wanted to, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Okay. Well, it didn't work out. Why not? Because I was scared of the ball. You know, we get that, right? Uh, we have that. Like I, I wanted to play in the NBA. Problem was I'm little, you know, and so, and can't shoot. You know, a lot of things, you know, I couldn't do that, right, you know? And then there was a season I thought I wanted to work in, for the railroad. I wanted to drive a train, be an engineer, you know, that'd be, that'd be fun and, and cool, you know, but didn't do that. And, you know, I thought, there, you know, about being a police officer at one point, because I just want to help people and, like, show up, be the Calvary, you know? Uh, I wanted to be a meteorologist at one point, mainly because I just wanted to chase tornadoes, right? I still want to chase tornadoes, and often do if they're close, you know? And so, so, you know, there are all kinds of things that I wanted to do. But one of the things that I really gave serious thought to, but I didn't know how to do it when I was 17, 18 year old, years old, was I thought about becoming a farmer. You know, I thought that would be kind of cool just to, to be a farmer. I was born in Indiana. I think that's part of what you're supposed to do, right? But I didn't want to like raise animals, right? Because animals leave things behind and, you know, and I didn't want to deal with any of that mess. I just wanted to like, like grow stuff. And, you know, since I was born in Indiana, that meant corn one year and soybeans the next, you know, and then every seven years you let it rest, you know? And so the, the, that was what I thought about doing, but I didn't know how to get started with that. You know, I thought about having like a little farmhouse, you know, if it's in Southern Indiana, it could be on a little hill. If it was in Central Indiana, it would not be on a hill. It would just be flat and have a farmhouse with, with like a, a wraparound porch, out in the middle of nowhere where it's quiet. And then at the end of the day, you could just sit on your porch with your chair, you know, on your, your swing and just watch your corn out there going, hello, you know, you know, that's just what I thought about doing. I thought that would be a great life. And of course I would drive a John Deere because absolutely you have to drive a John Deere. I get to drive a, a, a combine and it'd just be awesome. But then you think of, well, there's the harvest and that's a busy season and busy time. And the closest I ever got to a harvest was when Mamaw would, would make us go out into the garden and pick the corn and the beans and the tomatoes. And if we didn't, she'd get the wooden spoon after us, you know? And so we had to do that. But the harvest was something that was the point. Like you grew everything for the harvest. And there's something I think that's, that's, that's good for us to understand. There's something deeply moving about bringing in the harvest, and I think that's even just in farming aspect of it, because this is what everything worked up to. This is, what, this is the point. This is what we're after, right? And, and then it happens, and, and you go, and you, you take care of it, and, and you do it. And, and, and then you think there's some spiritual connotations to it that we're going to get into in just a minute that helps us rem be reminded of Jesus and of God and, and of us. Now, if you've never spent any time in the Midwest, consider yourself lucky, you know, but, you know, if you've never spent any time in the Midwest, except in the summers, okay, if, if any Midwesterners in here, you know, where are my people? Yeah. Woohoo, brothers, sisters, right? You know, Midwest summers are amazing. There's no humidity at night in August. You can put a hoodie on and shorts and you're comfortable, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. But winters, not so much. But if you've ever spent time in hit mid the Midwest, even if you're out in the middle of nowhere, during harvest season, it gets really, really, really busy. Like we call them like, like a, a natural roadblocks. There's combines just going down the road at six miles an hour. It's like, I'm late for work. And since I live in the country, my work is 42 minutes away. You know, it's just like that type of stuff. And, and then you get like, like tempted to drive underneath some of those things, you know, and you know, and y'all know what I'm talking about? Those, am I the only one that's always wanted to drive under those? Okay, good. I don't think my car would fit. But anyway, 
And so it gets really busy. And even in the small, tiny towns, there's like an activity. There's a buzz because all the farmers are bringing in the crops. And there's only a small window when they can harvest them and when they can, can, can bring it all in. And so these farmers will work for, for hours upon hours. And, and it's always dusty. And, and you can always tell where there's a harvest because you'll see a combine and there's just clouds of dust behind it. It looks like that. And you can see that for miles upon end. And then at night, because sometimes they'll just keep harvesting 24 hours a day. You see these combines out in these fields way out there and all around, and it's all flat. So there's no trees. It's just flat. And you just see these lights everywhere as these farmers are just working with just great urgency to meet their window, to bring in the harvest because it has to be done. And, and, and I know it's kind of hard to feel that for us here in Raleigh, because what do we grow? Pine trees. You know, it's, it's hard to, to maybe grasp this harvest. Now, us Midwesterners, we get it. We remember what that was like. We remember, remember seeing that. But, but for us, maybe it's just a little bit more difficult because this really does translate for us as a church that there is a harvest and there has to be great urgency behind it because, one, that's what we're called to do as, as believers and called to do as a group of believers together in a community called a church. We're called to be concerned about those who don't know Jesus. You see, believers and churches are called by Jesus not just to pursue those who do not know him. We're called to pursue those who do not know him with urgency, with urgency, because there has to be something. Because if we believe this is real, and we do believe this is real, then that means something for those who haven't followed yet, as much as it means for us. You see, when someone chooses to follow Jesus, we are commanded to help their faith grow. The churchy word for that is called discipleship. Called to help them grow and become disciples of Jesus. That's what churches are supposed to do. Now, the first week of April is coming up quickly. Thank you, because, you know, we're going to have the pollening, you know, and everyone's going to be sn sniffy and snuffy, and maybe it'll be like a few years ago and everything's green outside. You remember that a couple years ago? It was awful, but awesome at the same time. But the first week of April, that's going to be North Raleigh Christian Church's second anniversary right? We're already coming up on two years. And for those of you who were at, you know, around at the beginning, you know, it was, it was scary two years ago. You know, we had no idea if this was going to work, if we're going to make it. Long story short, if you don't know it, we were a campus of a, of a, a larger church, of a mega church, and, and that, you know, kind of went away. And, and we were given seven weeks to figure out how to start a church. Now, most of the time when churches are planted, which church planting is thankfully really, really common, you get like a year, like someone will get a dream and a vision and, and God will give them something and, and, they'll, and they'll show up in the town or, or they'll already be in the town and you get an entire year to gather people and resources and you get an entire year to come up with where you're going to go and what your dreams are, your, your mission, your vision, your values. We didn't get any of that. We just had to say like, okay, how can we survive? Because we may not. And that was the whole thing. And so we're sitting there thinking like, okay, how, how can we do this? And, and how can we solve this? We, we never got to come up with our mission, our vision, our values. We weren't offered that luxury. We were just trying to survive. But over the last five or six months or so, our elders, of which I'm one, we've been gathering like, okay, where are we going? And I know a lot of you are, have been asking, okay, what, we, we're here. What's next, right? Because you can't stay where you're at. We know that, right? You know, and there needs to be a vision for what, what do we want to become and what we want to do because where there is no vision, people will what? They will perish. And I think the same is true for a church because we have to be driving the ball down the field. And, and so we've been spending time praying and talking to people. And I've talked, I don't know how many pastors and preachers and, and, and all kinds of other groups. And I went on a retreat in Indiana and I mean, all this stuff, just trying to hammer this down. And we started talking and, 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 and our guys, we're all talking to other people. And so we've really been praying about what is the mission and the vision and the values of North Raleigh Christian Church. And it was a lot to work out, but we think we've found what God wants us to do. And I'm going to warn you, it's a lot, but it's good a lot, right? It's not a bad a lot. It's good a lot. Like saying like, look, look at all this corn you got to bring in, you know, you know, you know, it's good a lot. But there's going to be a lot for us to do and a lot for us to participate in because we have to pursue the mission of God. And we have to follow the leading of Jesus. And we have to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because when we do that, well, we will be doing exactly 
what we were called to do. And so in John chapter 4, we pick up our story of the woman at the well. And again, this is from last week, and, and if you missed it, just go back and, and watch it. But here we have Jesus. He introduces the concept of what the church is supposed to do, even though he didn't say it. He introduced the concept of what the church is going to do. This is early in his ministry, and he does it both in a very subtle way and a very straightforward way. Now, just a quick review. Jesus was leaving Jerusalem, and he was going north toward Galilee, and he had to go through this region called Samaria. Jesus being a Jew and all the Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was the, the capital and the center of, uh, of, of the Jewish people, Samaria was a place where Jews didn't like to go. Because those people were kind of a, a mixed race where thou, a thousand years before, the Jewish people had intermarried with people they were told not to marry with, and that was where they settled with. And so they were considered unclean, and, and Jewish people were not supposed to have anything to do with Samaritans. They were very racist toward them, and they, they hated them. And because of that, the Samaritans were like, well, you hate me. I, I hate you too, you know? And so it was just this big tension and, and this big issue between the Samaritans and the Jews. And so Jesus said, we're going straight through Samaria. And not only that, I need you, uh, 12 disciples who are with me going to town and buy food. I'm going to go up to this well because there was a woman that was there. And he had an interaction with her that was absolutely amazing. And he explains, you know, I asked this woman questions and this woman was is in the heat of the and she was by herself. And, and she was there because, you know, the women usually went to the, to the well to get water for the day in the morning, but she was there in the heat of the day because she just couldn't keep going because her life was a mess, her decisions were a mess, everything was a mess, she was broken and she was hurt, she was married five times, divorced five times, and living with a man who wasn't her husband. And everyone knew that. Everyone knew who she was. And so this outcast woman, full of shame, had this amazing encounter with the Savior of the world. In verse 28, we read this last week where we ended. It says, so the woman, after she realized that Jesus was the Christ, that's what she says. And she says, so the woman left her water jar. The whole reason why she was there. The woman left her water jar and went away to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And look at what verse 30 did. They went out of the town and they were coming to him, coming to Jesus. This woman just discovered who Jesus was. This outcast, this, this lesser than, just discovered who Jesus was. And Jesus says, this is exactly who I'm going to use to be the first one to bring the good news of God uh, being on earth, the good news of the Messiah, of the Christ being on earth, the good news that the Savior of the world is here. It's going to come to this entire people group for the first time through this woman. And so right away, this woman became the greatest evangelist that ever lived. She was the first. And when we read through the book of John, we see that over and over. She did her job. Jesus affected her life in such a way that she had to go and tell others. But think of who she was telling. She was telling this town that hated her and made fun of her and cast her out. She was telling the people in her life that, 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 that were against her. It's like, they've got to know about this. And she went, even though there was no reason, like for us, like someone gets on us at work, we're like, we're working on the other side of the office for two weeks, right? And she was like, no, 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 they need to know about Jesus and know now. And so the nature of what the woman of the well did is the same nature and the same mission of the church and the same nature and the same mission of our church. Jesus gave it to us in this great and, and simple detail in Matthew 28 when he gave us what was called the Great Commission. It says, in Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been granted to me. And this was at the very beginning in verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. Look, there's two things. You have baptized them and making disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so, that's the mission of every church right there. But for us, we wanted to put that in our own words in a way that, was, that could be summed up and really easy and so that we can remember it. Hopefully everyone memorizes Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. But if I ask you to raise your hand, who has got that memorized? Yeah, okay, we won't go there. Memorize those passages. They're good. They're, they're, they're foundational. But every church on this planet is called to share the grace, truth, love, and mercy of Jesus and reach those who do not know him 
no matter what. That's what we're all called to do. But every church is also called not just to save the lost. That's half of it. The other half is to walk with each other and help us become greater disciples or followers of Jesus, to learn together, to cry together, to laugh together, to eat together, to everything together, to become greater followers of Jesus and more involved with his mission in sharing with the peace, hope, and joy of God. That's what we all long for. So we were like, okay, we need to put this in our own words. You know, because this is our mission as a church, we get this. And so what's our mission statement? What do we want to be, you know, going forward as a church after two years? Because we want to dive into this. We want this to be who we are. We want this to be defining us. And so simply put, uh, the mission of North Raleigh Christian Church is simply this, helping people find and follow Jesus. Just that simple and just that easy. Because our job is to help people find Jesus for the first time and then help each other and them become greater followers of him. So everything about what we do as a church is about helping people find and follow Jesus, everything. And so the question I want to ask is, if this is your church home, and you just could respond in your heart, maybe I should make you stand up, but I don't know, it's weird, and we don't do that. Um, will you commit to helping people find and follow Jesus in your life? And if you do, let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. You know, because we know that there's people all around us that don't know Jesus. And we have to help them find him. And then there's those who know Jesus that we just all have steps in our growth. I mean, I do too. Every single one of us, whether you've been a Christian for eight days or 80 years, we all have growth and things to learn. And as we read on in chapter 4, we see something absolutely amazing, something that happens. Something that, that when it happens in modern, modern cultures and modern churches, especially, people like start to panic a little bit. I've, I've seen this before. It's interesting. It's something that Christians often say that, hey, we want this, but when it happens or it begins to happen, they're like, we'll literally leave the, the church that they're at, okay, because it makes people uncomfortable and, and it's different. Uh, but it's, it's so strange. Now, we've already established that the mission given to us by Jesus is to, to reach those who don't know him and, and then help each other grow in, in our faith, to help to find people and to help them follow Jesus. And so we get that. But what happens when people actually start coming? <laughs> not only that, how do you do that? And not only, only that, what is this big vision? And there's got to be a vision to making this happen. What does that look like? Well, I think that Jesus gives us a peek into it. In verse 31 through 33, it says this. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him. So they, they came back, and they saw him with this woman, they were, and, and they, were, they were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, and this is so profound coming up, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And so the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Maybe Jesus had a box of Swiss cake rolls under his robe. You know, I mean, what, 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 what's going on with that? You know, the disciples didn't know about that. He, and I'm pretty certain when manna fell from heaven in the Old Testament to the Israelites as they're leading or leaving Egypt, I'm pretty sure the manna was actually Swiss cake rolls, you know. You know what I'm talking about? Like you peel the, the, the chocolate off the outside, eat that, and then you turn it upside down so you get that texture. Man, there are my people up in this house. Yeah, yeah, we got it. But Jesus clearly wasn't talking about food here right? He's clearly not talking about food. He's teaching a lesson, a lesson that Jesus himself followed, and it's for us to follow. Look at what this says, and this will change our lives if we get this, I promise you. Verse 34 said, Jesus said to them, my food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus is saying what keeps me going is doing the will of the Father. So much deeper than being hungry, right? Jesus is saying, what, 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 my, what keeps me going is doing the will of the Father. Jesus knew why he was here. He knew what was going to happen in three, two and a half to three years after this. He knew what was coming. But what kept him going to the cross was him, I'm going to do the will of the Father who sent me. Jesus isn't saying, hey, follow me, and then you'll never be hungry again, and you'll never have to eat. That's, we, we get that. 
What he is saying is that no matter how hard life gets, no matter how much we struggle, no matter how much we fall down and, and just, just struggle with a sin, no matter, no matter how much we fail, no matter how much we doubt, no matter how scared we get over, over anything and over nothing, no matter how frustrated we become, no matter what, what will keep us going is if we are committed to and continue to do the will of the Father in our lives. So with whatever we have going on, what will sustain us is doing the will of the Father. While marriage is a mess, we'll do the will of God and it will sustain you in it. With how you love each other and how you honor each other and how you treat each other. Well, gosh, school is so hard and, and my, my friend group's falling apart and, and, and it's just all gossipy. Well, do the will of God and it will sustain you through that season. Work is just a mess. I hate it and it's hard and so stressful, and my boss is, uh, you know, and, and we'll do the will of God, and it will sustain us. Through every area of our lives, do the will of God, and it will sustain us, everything. And this isn't about eating Swiss cake rolls, unfortunately. This is about our food that sustains us, that gets us through, is to follow God. And so if we want to get through this life, if we want to make it out the other side of this, because we know this life ends, right, for all of us? There's another side of this. If we want to make it through this and make it out the other side, we do the will of God. Sure, we can make loads of money, and, 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 and we can have a great life, and, and then what? In the 80s, there was a, we were talking about bumper stickers at breakfast this morning, really weird. But in the 80s, there was this bumper sticker. You, you see if anybody remembers some of you are, well, I was born in 1999. Let's shut up, you know. The, there was a bumper sticker that said, he who dies with the most toys wins. Y'all remember that, you old people? Yeah, I remember that. I can remember, like, my dad seeing that, and he was saying, uh, no, he who dies with the most toys is dead. <laughs> and then there became counter bumper stickers. You know how Christians are good at that stuff, you know. He who dies with the most toys is still dead. And it's like, that'll win him to God. You know, okay, here we go. So we get that. But what's going to sustain us through all of these things is doing the will of God. Look at verse 35. He, he goes on. He says, do you not say there are yet four months and then it comes to the harvest? Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for the harvest. Now, this is speculation. I, I don't know if this is true or not. I had a, had a college professor talk about this, and I still remember it because it was amazing. Jesus was talking to his disciples when this was happening, and he said, look up for the fields are white with harvest. There's a thought that this was the point when the people were coming out of the town, and Jesus saw them wearing their white clothes, and that's what he was pointing to. I don't know if that is true or not. It, it, it checks out, and even if it is not true, well, that's exactly what he meant, so it may have been. You see, later in Jesus' ministry in Matthew, he, he, you know, this was recorded in Matthew 9, 35 through 38, and it says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and affliction. When he saw the crowds, look at this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Jesus always had compassion for them. Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. There's a great harvest out there today. These fields are ripe with those who do not know Jesus, and they're staring at a Christless eternity right in their face, not even. And so if the fields are so ripe for the harvest, you know, what, 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 do we, what do we do? We have to jump in at any moment, and we have to try to, try to figure this out and, and, and get involved in some ways. Just whatever we can do to find where those who don't know Jesus may be at. And how can we find and help people follow Jesus? That's what we're called to be, and that's what we're called to do. I mean, I got involved in something on accident, which is great. Um, it's actually going to be fun, I think. Um, there's a thing at, at Leesville Road Middle School um, called First Priority. Okay? It's, a, it's a Bible study, right? And, and it meets Thursdays at 7.15. Okay, you know who doesn't like mornings? There's things that I hate. Spiders, 
cilantro. Mornings. You know, it's like, it's, it's, all, it's all right there. It's like, oh, I can't do, I can't do mornings. I, I don't like it. But I got called and said, hey, and we need someone who's not in the school to lead it. Would you do that? And I'm thinking, 715, I've been out of youth ministry a long time, even though teenagers, sorry, adults, teenagers are way more awesome. Can we agree with that? Yeah. All right, Kathy, you know, you know, you know, teenagers are awesome. I love teenagers. So like, yeah, I'll do it. So it's 715 on Thursday mornings with middle school. We had our first one and there are like 12 or 13 kids there. And, 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 you know, we just played games, got to know each other. And so next week we really start, you know, doing some stuff. But as that bell rang and all, all these kids go to church, okay, these are, these are church kids. These are good kids. But as we were walking out and, and went through and, and, and I was walking through the school and the bell rang and other kids were coming in. Lee's Road Middle School, I think is the largest middle school in Wake County. And there were 11 or 12 kids there for a Bible study out of 900. The fields are ripe for the harvest. And that percentage is everywhere we go, at work, at, at your school, at, at our jobs, everywhere we go. And so we have to step into that, even if it means getting up at the early, right? You know, I mean, and some of you are like, I get up at 530, gold star, you know, I mean, <laughs> great for you. Pastor, uh, can we have coffee? Sure, what time? Seven, you can have coffee. You know, I mean, <laughs> And I'll do it early. I promise. So we start with 11 or 12 kids, and let's see what happens. I don't know. But we're going we'll to figure it out. Look at verse 37 and 38. It says, For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. When we say yes to this, we're entering into a labor that's been going on for a long time. And I don't know if anyone told you this when you said yes to following Jesus. I'm going to talk to Christians for just a second. I don't know if anyone told you this when you became a Christian, when you became a believer, and, and you made that decision to step into that faith. I don't know if anyone said it, because I didn't get it either. Okay, No one told me. When we say yes to following Jesus, we say yes to entering into his labor as well. Okay? When we say yes to following Jesus, yeah, we say yes to him. Him saving us. But we also say, yes, I'm going to be a part of this kingdom, and I'm going to be a part of this mission. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Luke 19.10, Jesus said, for the Son of Man, seek and save the lost. So we know that, that this is what we're called to do and, and what we're called to be and where we're called to go. Look at verses 39 through 42. It says, look at what happens. I mean, just, just, just look at what happens because this woman ran to, to the town. It said, many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. Okay, she went, she paved the way. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And Jesus stayed there for two days. And many more believed because, this, because of his word. And then they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves now. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world because this woman ran, left her jar and ran. And so you see what happened here. She became one of the best evangelists who ever lived because she looked past her shame and she looked past the people judging her. And she looked past the people that she tried to avoid all of her days to say they need to hear about this. A few chapters before and a few weeks before, we talked about this man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus. This is amazing because there's such a great contrast between Nicodemus and the woman at the well. And it doesn't make sense. And, and culturally, and, and it's like one of those underdog stories. It, it just doesn't make sense. But there's such a contrast between Nicodemus and the woman at the well. Nicodemus was very wealthy. The woman at the well was, was poor. Nicodemus was powerful. The woman of the well was not she was lowly. Nicodemus had respect. The woman of the well was judged because of her past. Nicodemus came at night. The woman of the well met Jesus in the middle of the day at noon, literally said that, and then she ran in the daytime to tell everyone else while Nicodemus was hiding with his questions. And so we see more and more of this difference. Nicodemus was a Jew. The woman of the well was a Gentile. Nicodemus was a male, which was what you wanted to be in that ancient culture. Nicodemus, or the woman of the well was a female. Nicodemus was based in Jerusalem. The woman of the well lived out in the sticks out in Samaria where no one wanted to go. Yet it was the woman at the well who immediately became a great influence for the gospel of Jesus. 
Nicodemus eventually got there. And we're going to read more about him. He comes up two more times in the book of John. But Nicodemus was right away. You see, there's something I want to I just don't know exactly how to say it without being super offensive, okay? And that's not the point of this. Jesus doesn't need our talents or our money. He's already got that. He needs our willing hearts. Does that make sense? And when we give Jesus our willing hearts, then we're going to give our talents, we're going to give our money, give our time, give all those things. That flows out of that. Sometimes we feel like, because we're Americans, I'm going to show up and save the day. The day has already been saved. We just need to give him our hearts and join in on his mission. He asks us to do. That's what we're called to do and be a part of. And so what I want to do is I want to introduce you all where we're going. Does this mic keep cutting out? Okay, you're annoying, Mike. I hate you today. Got good power. I don't know what's happening. Can I just yell if it goes out? So, all right, there we go. And if you're online, you're watching, I'll tell you later. Okay, it's all good. <laughs> okay, so I want to introduce our, 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 our vision because, because it's important. We're going to call it this, 1510, okay? And there, there's a little logo for it, uh, 1510, okay? And it's really simple, but it's, but it's really, really big. And I'll just hang with me through it. So we want to reach 1% of our community, all right? That's the one. We want to reach 1% of our community in a five-mile radius of the church building. Okay, don't overthink that. If you're, not, if you're outside of five miles, keep coming and keep bringing people, okay? <laughs> don't overthink that. Okay. We want to reach 1% of our community in a five-mile radius within 10 years. And that means within 10 years, we want to be a church of 1,510 people. Okay? That's where we're going. Because in a five-mile radius, there are 149,974 people. But 1510, 1499 didn't work, so we just fudged a little bit. <laughs> and I know that's like, like that's scary and that's big, but that is, that is, that is what, what is praying. We've got to reach people in this community. And of those people in this five mile radius, we want doctors and lawyers and homeless people and teachers and children and teenagers and moms and dads, divorced people, single people, alcoholics, sinners, saints. We want everybody Amen. to know Jesus who lives in our community. And so that's where we're going to go with this. And look, and I want to be very clear. Don't miss this. I'm going to say, this is not about growing big. This is not about pride. This is not about ego. This is strictly about being obedient to the mission of God and the call to reach those who are far from God. And that's all. And that's all. The reason, that, another reason there's a number on it, because I look at 1,510 people, and I see every number represents one person. That, every per that means that, that those people have either found Jesus for the first time and now they're following, or those people came to us who are already Christians and now they're following Jesus in a greater way. And so that is why, you know, when we look at this, this is a big deal and it's huge. It's going to be hard. And I know it's challenging and I know it's scary. And now we still have to like, like fix some things, get some systems going. And I know it's going to take every single one of us to participate in it. I also know that there'll be some that'll be like, ah, this isn't for me. But we got to honor God. And so we're going to go for it. And I know there's pushback. Look, I get it. Because we like a small church. You know, we like to come in and feel like we know each other and know everybody. But you do realize we're about 180 people on Sundays. We're past that point of being able to know everyone anyway, right? Look, I'm the pastor. There's people in this room I don't really know. Okay, that's, that, that, that's over. You can do that until your church of about 30 or 35. And then you start not being able to know each other. Okay, so we're already past that point anyway. So that's cool. It's all, it's all good. Um, if you're here now, you know, it's special treatment. We always hang, we'll hang out, right? You know, it's, it's all good. So that's what we have to do. And if we're at 180 people, just think about it. We're like 0.1%. I don't know. We're like, we got to get nine tenths of a percent to go. You know, we're, we're, we're on our way. But also, when the church gets bigger, and even now, our church is already there, we have to make a commitment to getting to know people and staying small in a sense. And you know the best way to do that? Life groups. Okay? If you're not in a life group, you need to get in one. 
Okay, you can go to the welcome desk, out the doors, turn left, go to the welcome desk, and we have sheets there for you to help you get involved in a life group that meet all throughout the week. And so if you're not in a life group and you want to connect, that is the best way, all right? You can come find me. I'll help you, look, I'll help you find it. And so we'll get you into a life group, and then you can connect on an intimate level with people who are walking through life the same way, age as, the same way as you are. There's men's groups, women's groups, there's, there's family groups, there's, there's groups of all ages. Like, we have got one group that's got people young and old all in the same group. It, it just is fine. So find your life group. Another way to keep the church small, no matter how big we get, is to become a difference maker. Now, we call difference, volunteers difference makers here. So we believe that you're going to make an eternal difference in someone's lives. And so if you want to, to keep the church small, serve someplace and connect in community there as well. Like I love the, the, like the worship team. You know, I, I serve on that as well. You know, we have practice. And then on Wednesday night after practice, we go to pickled onion and eat wings. Community and cholesterol, you know. <laughs> it goes hand in hand, but bacon, cheese, Swiss cake rolls would be the best. Okay, here we go. But please hear my heart. I personally can't stomach the fact that people are going to hell. It hurts. I personally can't stomach the fact that we as the church have the answer to every problem through Jesus Christ and through his word. And people are striving against life and striving against pain and are so busy and so buried in their phones that they're missing what true joy and true life is. That bothers me. And I hope it bothers you too. I hope it makes you get to the point where you're driven, like I need to get up in a combine and start harvesting too. Because that's what we're called to be and called to do because this harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so when it comes to Vision 1510, will you jump on board and help? It's going to take a lot. Okay, it's going to take a lot. Inviting and serving and loving and crying with people if, as there's hardships in life and walking with them through it, only to see the joy on the other side of it. There's going to be a lot of laughter. There's going to be a lot of babies born. There's going to be a lot of really cool things. Just, we'll give. We'll do it. There will be a lot of things. So how is this done? All right, and, and we have some core values we'll walk through again. So don't overthink these, especially the first one. If you've gone to church your entire life, don't overthink the first one. Our core values that kind of drive everything are some of this. The first one is a church of endless second chances. Okay, And, and what we mean by that is, is that there's nothing that we can do to make God love us less and nothing we can do to make God love us more. And a church of endless second chances means this, that when we're following Jesus and we stumble and fall down in the mud, that's a second chance, right? So when you became a Christian, if you fought sin, does that mean you're out? No, you get another second chance every time, right? 1 John 1, 1 John 1, 7 says that we are continually cleansed and continually purified from our unrighteousness. It's a continual action. And so that's what we get to participate in. Now, look, Hebrews 10 also warns against something called deliberate sin. Okay, there's two different things here. Striving toward Jesus and stumbling and falling is one thing, but saying, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm not changing my life because I like participating in this behavior, that's called deliberate sin. And that's really scary because Hebrews 10 says that there is no sacrifice for sin remaining for that. And that's a whole can of worms on theology there. So we're not talking about, hey, you know, become a Christian, go do whatever you want. That's not what endless second chances means. Endless second chances is the same thing that you and I get every single day of our lives because we all sin, right? Okay, if you don't sin, raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, you just sin because you're a liar. <laughs> all right? So endless second chances. The next one is rooted in truth. Rooted, rooted in truth, we trust in Scripture because it leads us to Jesus and understanding why we're here. We believe that we have the inspired Word of God. The reason why I believe it is because I had classes and studied archaeology, and, and, and I know when it comes to New Testament documents that, yes, the original things that Paul and Peter and John wrote, we do not have the original ones, but there are copies from the original. And I'll be more than happy to talk about all of that. And there's been some tablets and some booklets that were just found. They're made of copper, and they're already, like, proving more things. It's amazing. And this just happened in the last couple of months. 
And so be a student of this stuff. This is real. It's held this test of time. It's unchanging. Oh, the Bible's been changed for political. Anyone who says that has not studied anything because it has not. The Old Testament isn't even questioned because of archaeology. So we know this is the Word of God. The proofs that we have, there's tens and tens of thousands of proofs that this is unchanging, where we don't judge Shakespeare that only has one or two. But the Bible has proved itself over and over. Why do people want to disprove the Bible? Because if you disprove the Bible, you can do whatever you want to do and treat people however you want to treat them. So rooted in truth. The third one is you belong here, okay? Everyone belongs here, that this is a place that we all can belong because we are real about our brokenness and real about how Jesus is changing our lives. We know we're not perfect. We know that life is hard, and that's why we're a church where it's okay to not be okay. So when you come in and you're not okay for a season, we get it, but our goal is to not leave you there, to get you through that, because God doesn't want us to stay in that way. Also, we got to be a church where faith is bold. Their faith is just bold. That, that we believe in pursuing faith means, means being bold and taking big risks. Look, this Sunday is a big risk. Because there, you can, I mean, anyone in this room is like, oh, that, that's weird, or I don't like that, I'm not for that. And we're in the South, you, you know, there's a saying, you can't sling a dead cat without hearing a Baptist, hitting a Baptist church, right? So, you know, you can go anywhere, right? You know, you can go anywhere. We get that. But faith that's bold taste risk, and faith that's joining where God is moving. The next one is simply this. Come and see. Come and see what God is doing. We join in the greatest mission on this earth, and we're doing it by creating intentional environments where we can encounter Jesus, whether it's life groups or student ministry or kids ministry or our trips or our, our you know, mission trips that are, that are trying to get put together, all kinds of things, Sunday morning experience, serving opportunities. Come and see. And the last is simply go and do. We're all called to take part of this mission and to jump in and to go. And so we're going to just go and do because we're called to participate in the greatest story ever told. That just happens to all be true. So those are our core values. And everything is going to be driven, you know, and, and, and touched on that. And so what kind of church do we need to be to accomplish this? You know, a couple, several years ago, I, I was thinking of, you know, how I was raised and what kind of church I was raised and where I was schooled at, and it was a particular style of church, and then there were other styles, and, and there seemed to be all these different, different things going on and, and, and how they interacted and how they did. But realistically, every church can go into three categories, uh, one of three categories. So now there's different parts of those categories, but we're just going to go down to three categories. And Last year in March, Wally, Samantha, and myself, we drove down to Orlando, Florida for a conference, and there was an author and a pastor named Josh Howerton, and he, he put on the screen like this summary of these churches, like that's exactly what, what, I, what, I, what I'm thinking. And then just a couple of weeks ago, our elders and staff, we went down to Savannah for a church leadership conference, and, and they taught it there too. So this isn't mine. I didn't create this. So, so look at these circles, this Venn diagram. You have three types of churches. The first type is you have the, the doctrinal church. Okay, this is the church that teaches the Bible, Bible knowledge, break down the T, and that's what you go. And, and it's the Word of God church, a church that's all about the Word, okay? So it's a doctrinal church. That's, the, that's where I came out of, that everything is about just learn the Bible, learn, learn, learn. Does that sound like a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing to learn the Word of God as much as you can. That's actually really good. However, there's some dangers to this. At least with my tribe and where I came from, people got really judgmental. And really, there's a word called legalistic. And that there wasn't a lot of grace and mercy when people fell down and fell. There wasn't a lot of like patience for, for those who are, are, are struggling with things and, and, and trying to help them through. It was just, here, do this. this is, and it was just strict and harsh, and it was cold, and it was difficult. And those were some of the weaknesses. It just lacked it lacked mercy. And so while, hey, learning the God's, God's word and living by God's word, yay, there was a downside and it missed some things. The next kind of church on the right is the attractional church. 
you know, mission of God. You know, this was about deeds. This, these churches are like, how can we get as many people who don't know Jesus in? And we just want to, we want to get them saved. You know, we want them to find Jesus and we'll do whatever it takes short of sin. Sometimes now they do, but anyway, they will do whatever it takes to attract as many people possible to come into our gatherings. This was about, you know, just filling the rooms full of people so they can hear the basics of Jesus to save as many as possible. Does that sound like a bad thing? No, (laughs) no, that is a good thing, okay? Just make sure that's good. However, there was a problem with these kinds of churches. A lot of times there was zero depth, and they had the wide open front door that people were flowing through, but they had a back door that was just as wide and people flowing out. And because there wasn't any root, when life got really hard or when sin and temptation attacked, it's withered and we're gone. You know, I was part of one of those churches once, not as a as lead pastor, but I, but I saw it. But, but I appreciated the heart behind trying to reach as many people as possible. And so you have the doctrinal, which is we're learning the Word of God as much as possible. And then there's attraction of trying to reach as many as possible. And then the, the last one is spirit-filled. If you're an old-timey church person, it's would sort have been probably called charismatic and how you grew up, that type of deal. And, and the spirit-filled church is about, we're going to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we're going to let him do what he does, let him lead us, let him guide us, and we're going to participate in things, and God's going to show up every time we get together, and there's going to be things going to happen that we can't explain, but God did it there. We know it was, does that not sound awesome too? So that's great, but there's a downside. A lot of times churches like this, they don't do things how the Bible says to do them. This is just, yes, I'm not judging any particular church. This is just overall. There's a lot of times that that these churches will will, will go just off, off the rails because they do what feels like should be done. Well, realistically, I think we should live is right there in the middle where all three of these come together. Well, we are a church where, again, we're, we're learning God's word. And so when, when the spirit-filled side comes of it, we can look, okay, well, that's biblical and that's not, you know, and it, and it keeps it there accountable. Or the doctrinal church is like, ah, let's learn the Bible and do things this way. But what about this lost person who this is really weird to? How can we say this in such a way that it reaches them and they can understand it, you know, that the attractional comes in? So they all help each other and, and, and pull each other along and, and protect each other and are with each other. And so for us as a church going forward, how I would like for us to do that is live right there in that yellow triangle, right where all three of these come together. And there's aspects of this. Like, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't fully understand how it's going to work. I know it's going to be fun figuring it out. But we have everything we need. We have the Word of God. We have the mission to reach the lost. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us to be our comforter and our guide and our director. We can do this. It's going to be fun. It's going to be hard. Y'all want a list? Yeah, come on. So here's what I want us to do. Here's our action steps for this week. The first is simply this. Will you pray about becoming a farmer? I'm not talking about growing Swiss cake rolls. Will you pray about becoming a farmer that when you go to your school tomorrow, you think of someone who doesn't know Jesus? When you go to work tomorrow, you think of someone who doesn't know Jesus? When you go home after church, you get into your household, and you think of someone who doesn't know Jesus. You think of your friend group. You think of your online group. You think of everyone. I want to be on this mission, and I'm going to climb into my spiritual combine, John Deere. You know, I'm going to climb into that combine, and I'm going to start participating in this harvest. And the second one, because I think it's really important. It doesn't seem to fit with this list, but I think it's really important, is commit to learning God's Word. You know, I, I challenge you the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, Learn that this week. Commit that to memory. You know, let that just soak through you because that is the mission of every church and the mission of every Christian. So commit to learning God's word. The next one is this, number three, find your one. Who is one person in your life who doesn't know Jesus or at very least is is out of church, they don't go to church, and make that your mission to bring them in the next couple of weeks. And then when they come, make that your mission to help them stick by discipling them. If you Jesus, and it, I'll be more than, you can email me, I'll be more than happy to walk you through how to do that because I want to fill up that gray baptistry and watch you baptize your one. I don't want to do it. 
Well, I do. I don't think that sounds bad. I would rather you, because that's what God called us to do. We're all called to participate in this. And so will you pray about and find your one person? I've got mine, and he's going to be really hard, but I'm going to work on him. And I'm not sure exactly how it's going to go or how long it's going to take, but I, I got it. And we're going to go for it. All right? So find your one. And then the last one is simply this. Will you join us in 1510? Will you join us in this? Because it's a big thing. And I want us to imagine something. Okay, let's do it. Like, I, don't, I really do this. Y'all remember the first night we met when we just found out we we're going to be an independent church? And it was a Wednesday night. We had coffee and donuts. There were 94 of us. If you were in the room, will you stand up? All right. So we, here was the base. This is what started it. Thank you. Okay, you can have a seat. Picture this for a second, all right? Ten years down the road, we're in church, and I say, hey, you 94 people, if you're still here, will you stand up? And you're surrounded by all these people who have been finding and following Jesus. And they're like, okay, y'all sit down. How many of you were here the day we first talked about this, where you all stand up? And then everyone gets to stand up in the room. And then you sit down. And then we say, how many of you were baptized since, we, since this happened? And we get to see all those people stand up. How many of you were able to, to find a deeper relationship in following Jesus since we started? And they stand up. And all of us in this room gets to sit there and think, wow, look at what God did. Amen. That's what we're asking you to be a part of. This isn't about us. This sure as heck isn't about me. This is about the mission of Jesus and that we all get to participate 